Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Kinseth, and I am the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum in Dallas, Texas. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you today for our lecture on El Desencanto, or the Disenchantment, uh, with Aaron Schulman. So before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes. So first of all, we are going to uh, request that you keep yourself on mute uh, throughout the presentation, just so we don't pick up any unnecessary background noise. Second, I do want to let you know that we are recording this session with the hopes that we might be able to add it to the Meadows Museum's YouTube channel uh, in the future. And finally, um, I am going to invite you to use the chat box today to uh, share any questions that you have. You can start adding questions right away, but we will hold them till the end. Um, and at that point, I will share them with our with our presenter. Um, and should you prefer to unmute yourself, um, you can always type into the chat box that you would like to unmute yourself to ask your question. So it is my pleasure to welcome Aaron Schulman. Schulman is the author of the nonfiction historical narrative, uh, which I have right here, The Age of Disenchantments, the epic story of Spain's most notorious literary family and the long shadow of the Spanish Civil War. He holds an undergraduate degree from John Hopkins University and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Montana. He's a former Fulbright scholar and his work has appeared um, in many places, including The Believer, The New Republic, The American Scholar, The Wall Street jo Journal, El Pais, Hazlitt, and the Los Angeles uh, Review of Books. So it is my pleasure to welcome Aaron Schulman today and to turn the program over to him now. Thank you so much, Anne. I really appreciate you putting this together and reaching out to me quite a while ago. And I wanna thank the Meadows Museum for being a great resource and, and meeting place for, for all things in Spain. And I know the museum right now is going through a sad transition with the, uh, the director having passed away this week. So I hope this is a, um, an event where we can you know, speak to the mission of the, the museum and, and, and be grateful for what it does. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, and hopefully you watch the, the movie of this Encanto or we'll watch it maybe in the next day um, and, and went on the weird journey with, with, the, with the Panero family, which I can ho hopefully uh, elucidate here as well as some things related to Spanish culture and history. So I usually like to start my talks by reading from the introduction to my book, which tells you a little bit about me and why I fell in love with the family and how they connect to, to Spanish um, history. And so, well, so I, I did wanna know, I'm coming to you from Spain. I recently moved back and normally I also like to hold up a copy of my book, but all my copies are stuck in a shipping container that arrives Monday. Um, and I am, I wanted to know, my wife is an artist who is from Spain and, and some of her art is right behind me there. So, um, so we're, to, we're talking about a, lo a long tradition of Spanish artists um, and, and I'm, and I'm in, in the city and in Barcelona where certain scenes of my um, book take place. So this is my first talk about my book while being in Spain. So it's, it's extra special to me. Um, all right, so I, I'm gonna begin by reading to you from the introduction and to give a little context because I'm not starting at the very, very beginning. The book, uh, the book opens with um, the, the death of um, Garcia Lorca uh, when he was uh, assassinated at the start of the Spanish Civil War. So I narrate that and I, and I discuss a little bit about um, how, the, how there was a, uh, there, the moon wasn't visible on the night of his death and he was a poet who's sort of known as his muse was the moon or one of his muses. So there was this bitter irony in that. Um, all right, so I'll just, I'll just start here. This is a couple pages into the introduction. Uh, nearly 76 years after Lorca's death in the summer of 2012, I was living in Madrid where the Spanish Civil War was now a collective memory, albeit still a very touchy one. Four years earlier, when I was 26, I had met a Spanish woman named Elisa while visiting Guatemala. When we tell this story today, our own neatly packaged narrative hewn from memory, as you know, uh, if you watch the movie about it, Los, Los Paneda, that it has a lot to do with uh, the stories we tell from our memories. 
Um, when we tell the, uh, the story today, our own neatly packaged narrative hewn from memory, it comes off as obnoxiously picturesque. She was volunteering in an orphanage where I had volunteered the year before. When I came back to see the children that summer, there she was and there I was. Three years later, we got married in an Andalusian patio full of orange trees surrounded by Spaniards and Americans, everyone eating from the same humongous paella with our names written in red peppers. I liked living in Spain. Before moving to Madrid, we spent two years in Elisa's hometown of Cordoba in the south. There I lucked into a group of friends that made the small provincial city with its labyrinthine alleys feel like home. During the work week, I mixed freelance assignments with the novel I hoped to finish. On the weekends, Elise and I got together with her family or our friends for the heavy midday meal, followed by the part of eating in Spain that I found nearly as delicious as the food, La Sobremesa, the period after eating when you sit and drink coffee and talk for as long as the conversation lasts, sometimes even until you're hungry again. I really didn't have much figured out besides my love for literature and Elisa, but that was enough. Life in Spain was good. In other respects, life in Spain wasn't so good. The financial crisis had left the country in free fall. Unemployment nationally was at nearly 30%, and it was much higher in Cordoba. After the nonprofit where Elisa worked ran out of money, she spent nine months unemployed. We finally left Cordoba for Madrid, where she found a job. It was a bleak moment in Madrid, too, with no shortage of images into which to pour our anxiety up about our future in Elisa's country, never mind the, the future of the country itself. Up in the sky, massive skeletal construction cranes hung in stillness above buildings they had failed to complete. On the ground, angry demonstrations snaked through the centuries old avenues and cafe filled plazas. Every time we left our tiny studio in the neighborhood of Lava Pies, we seemed to get swept into one of these daily marches that ran like a river through the city center each different in the colors of the demonstrators shirts and the words of their chants, but all issuing from the same headwater of indignation, la crisis, the crisis. The only person who was optimistic at the time was Elisa's grandmother back in Cordoba, who reassured us that things would never get as bad as they were during the civil war, which she had lived through as a child. Now this would be when we get to the Paneda, so it's not just about me. Amid all of this, as Elise and I were starting to seriously consider leaving Spain, one night in 2012, my friend Javi invited us over to watch a movie. Javi is that friend I always seem to seek out wherever I am, who ups my degree of cool by association. The difference this time around was that Javi's studied hipness had a European flavor. He smoked cigarettes with gestures that alluded to scenes from French new wave films cruised around on a Royal Enfield motorcycle and read worrisome quantities of Goethe. I'd met him playing basketball in Cordoba, and now we'd ended up living a short walk from each, each other in Madrid. As it turned out, Javi's invitation would be a big bang of sorts in my life, a day that unsuspectingly proliferated into thousands of other days, leading me back in time and deep into lives distinct from my own, but which nonetheless seemed to speak directly to me. Javi set up the projector in his living room and explained that we were going to watch uh, a Spanish cult documentary from the 1970s called El Desencanto. I tried translating in my head, the unhappiness? No, I thought, too stilted. The disenchantment? Maybe. I would just have to see. Javi didn't want to say much about the film, only that it was about a dead Spanish poet and his strange family. Lo vas a flipar, Javi said, hitting play. You're going to love it. The opening credits rolled over an old timey black and white family photo, a mother posing in a shadowy sitting room with three, ad three young adorable boys. No one in the photo looked happy in the least. This was the beginning, the moment I met the Panedos. The person missing from the photo was the father and husband, Leopoldo Panedo, a man people often referred to as the poeta oficial or poet laureate of the Franco dictatorship. The premise of a desencanto is disarmingly simple. Mother and sons convene in 1974, 20 years after that photo was taken, to talk about dad who died 12 years earlier in 1962. As is the case with every family, but especially this one, things in fact aren't simple at all. Leopoldo Panero left behind an embittered, seductively eloquent widow, Felicidad Blanc, who has her own version of the family story to tell. The same goes for her three brilliant and troubled sons who compete for the title of Paneda Poetic Heir. Juan Luis, the eldest, is a hard drinking dandy who puts on the airs of a reincarnated F. Scott Fitzgerald with a bullfighter's swagger. Leopoldo Maria, the middle son, has been in and out of mental institutions, a doomed genius 
in the tradition of the French poet Antoine Artaud. Michi, the youngest, is the handsome guide to the Panero universe and its subtle pyrotechnician, lighting the fuse to the family's powder keg of rivalries and resentments, which blow up on camera. Lingering them in the background of their story is the pall of the dictatorship, like an illness they've learned to live with. As they throw open the closet where all the dirty laundry has been moldering for decades, the film turns into a communal hatchet job on the memory of Leopoldo Panero, as well as a deconstruction of that most universal and inescapable of human institutions, family. Two things elevate El Desencanto from being a uniquely bizarre on-screen therapy session into a more powerful and lasting artifact. One, the viewer understands that the family is a microcosm of the society that produced it, and what's wrong in one is connected to what's wrong in the other. Family is the primal seat of memory, make, making private myths out of experiences that are inseparable from public myths. The Panedos can be seen as a metaphor for Spain and its past. Two, the Panedos are collectively Don Quixote, while the great disheveled knight errant of Spanish literature is most famous for tilting at windmills. The reason he did so wasn't because he was a born man of action. It was because he had ingested too many books and taken them literally. His fantasy filled with everything he had read, wrote Cervantes of his tragic comic hero. Enchantments as well as combats, battles, challenges, wounds, courtings, loves, torments, and other impossible foolishness. This overdose of narrative is what spurred Don Quixote to go on his epic adventures. The Paneros too have saturated their mind with books and the manner in which they talk and act comes off nearly as headlong as the night from La Mancha. They seem to believe that their collective past combined with their present lives is a novel they're in the midst of writing. It become, becomes clear that the family, <coughs> excuse me. It becomes clear that the family doesn't know how not to frame its existence inside of literature. Storytelling is their vice. I recall the famous opening line of Anna Karenina, which I would soon learn had already been applied to the Panedos ad nauseum. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. In El Desencantos, the Paneros up the ante, their shared talent, and infuse their in its own wayness with a prophecy. We learn that none of the sons appear able to produce children, so they may have reached El Fin de Raza, the end of the bloodline. The film then is a kind of thea theatrical last will and testament, which explains why the stakes feel so high. They revel in this atmosphere of refined fatalism, casting themselves as characters in a Wagnerian opera. Of course, the Paneros are just people like you and me, no matter how poetic or odd, but it's as if they refuse to accept this banal fact, as though simply being one more family buffeted by history and chance without the gilding of literary myth would be unbearable. They opt instead to invest their story with a mystique that only art can provide. In doing so, they construct a new legacy. Yes, I thought when the film was over, the disenchantment, that's the right translation because the title was both the truth and a lie. Yes, life in Franco Spain seemed to have robbed them of an essential wholeness, but the Paneros delighted in their dissolution, willfully converting it into literature to enchant the viewer. The documentary I had just seen was a work of art, undoubtedly, yet so were the Paneros. They lived under Lord Good's moon. Javi turned the lights on and asked, asked us what we thought. I rhapsodized about the film in overheated Spanish. Then Elisa and I said good night and walked home. Obsessions start unassumingly like love. My obsession with the Paneros started with me poking around on the internet. Who were these people? What had happened to them? Did the prophecy come true? I learned that the disenchantment wasn't a mere cult curio for the hobbies of Spain, but a national legend that persisted in the memory of older generations. When the film came out in 1976, one year after Franco's death, it became a cultural phenomenon, part scandal and part catharsis. During the beginning of Spain's precarious transition to democracy, just one year before the passage of the 1977 amnesty law known as the Pact of Forgetting, Along came the Paneros, dredging up the past and prosecuting their dead father figure who was associated with the Franco regime with no interest in amnesties. Their dismantling of traditional myths about family was seen as a symbolic deconstruction of the nation's recently deceased father figure and his legacy. The forces of history swept up the disenchantment and made the Paneros famous. Their personal story flowing into Spain's national one. The film changed their lives. 
to understand the Paneros, I realized I had to better understand Spanish history. So like Don Quixote, I read a lot. I read books by the family from their poetry to their memoirs. And I read books by or about other, about writers or topics that intersected with the family. I read in greater depth about the Spanish Civil War and the writers who had lived through it or like Lorca, not lived through it. I soon learned that Leopoldo Paneda was much more complex than the political character relegated to the margins of history. Just as I learned that his wife and three sons weren't only the characters they had played in the infamous film about their family. Then I started reading in a testimonial sense, seeking out scraps of history and the memories of living people. I interviewed the director of the documentary and a few other close-up observers of the Panedas. The more I read and the more I listened, the more I came to see that the family's story held within it, Spain's story across the breadth of the, of the 20th century and vice versa. After two years, it dawned on me that I had stumbled onto an epic that had never been fully told before, the collective history of the family. So that is part of the introduction, which hopefully gives you a sense of how the book, how my book came to be uh, written um, and how I met the family, which you know, hopefully most of you have or will meet oh, the same way through, through the film. So I wanted to take you through a little uh, slideshow um, to, to give you some image, some more images and, and context and just a bit about um, a bit about the making uh, of the, the book and, and the history and the history around the film. So let me just share my screen here. All right. So the, the book, it, so as I mentioned just now reading the introduction, I, I did a lot of research um, to, to write the book. And so that involved a lot of archival work. And that was some of my, my, some of my favorite stuff, which is when history becomes real and you're actually getting into these documents. So uh, here I have, um, this is Felicidad Blanc's, her, it was called a safe conduct pass um, that you had after the war just to move from one area of Spain to another. And this was the first vacation after the Spanish Civil War. She had to get this pass to go to the beach in the Basque country. Um, uh, and, I, and I just love that feeling of being transported back with her. This is a, she was kind of a well, a well-known person in the upper class growing up in, in Madrid. And this was a caricature that was done of her in a, new, a newspaper as a teenager, because she was the captain of, of a very bad field hockey team, um, but, but very spirited. And then one of my, one of my other favorite parts was reading the love letters between um, Felicidad and Leopoldo from 1940 the the year before they married and and the, they're completely these like overwrought slightly histrionic love letters and you know, they're in love with each other but they're more kind of in love with being in love with each other and you can already see in the letters that they love the story of their relationship kind of more than the actual relationship so reading through those and so many other letters and other documents was was just fascinating um so so this is a story or this is a picture of kind of the, the poetic scene in Madrid before the war, which Leopoldo Panero, the father, was a part of. And you can see him encircling his head right there. This is 1935 celebrating um, uh, a, a book award for Ale, Vicente Alessandre, who would, who would win the Nobel Prize uh, later. He's a, he's a poet. And this is um, Juan Panero, Leopoldo Panero's brother. This is Luis Rosales. He was the his family was the one who was hiding Garcia Lorca in Granada, if anyone knows the story of him, of, uh, of Lorca being taken out there and then thrown into jail, then, then, then killed. This is Miguel Hernandez, a famous poet from the war who died of tuberculosis in a, in a prison afterwards. So this moment kind of captures in, in amber these people before the, the war just ripped them all apart and, and rewrote their lives mostly in disastrous ways. And, and Leopoldo, interestingly, although he did a right-hand turn during and after the war and became part of the, the dictatorship before the war, he was a communist poet. Um, and so you can see him next to his, his mentor, Pablo Neruda, right there. And then later, you know, Neruda went either, even further left, uh, Leopoldo went uh, farther right, and they had this kind of 
uh, public poetic battle through, through poems in the 1950s attacking each other. So I think this is it's just a, a wonderful photo of, of a time that was lost forever. This is Leopoldo also before the war with his brother. Juan was actually was killed in the war, um, not in combat, but, but in a car accident. So here's Felicidad. Um, this was her as, as, a, as a young woman. This is actually in the Basque country at the beach, I think before the summer of the safe conduct passed, but this is where her, her family went. Um, she was known, pe people called her the, the, the prettiest girl in Madrid. Um, she was quite beautiful. And this is her later in life after uh, El Desencanto, which made her, her well known. And she had published a memoir that was briefly uh, a, be a bestseller. So this is Leopoldo and Felicidad on their wedding day, and they don't, they don't look especially happy, um, and maybe that, that predicted some things to come. They were, they were married in 1941, uh, two days after the, uh, or two years after the war ended. So now's, now's where I get to bring in the, the Meadows Museum a bit, which is really interesting with their incredible collection of of Spanish art from the 20th century. And actually Leopoldo Panero was very involved in the Spanish art world, especially during the 1950s. So he, he was a kind of cult, culture, culture czar, you could say, or an art czar um, in, the, in, in the dictatorship. And so in the 1950s, he was um, tapped to do a, uh, a biennial kind of bringing together art from Latin America and, and Spain. And it was kind of a tricky task because the he needed to make what they were doing somehow feel relevant internationally, but also it had to meet all the strict moral standards of the dictatorship. Uh, so it was, it was a challenging task and here he is. Um, and he was a supporter of the arts and even as he became clearly fascist or supportive of the regime, he stayed in close touch with sort of his old friends and people who were exiled and tried to bring them back. So he was a figure that was kind of hard to pin down um, politically, even though he made clear choices to, to support uh, the dictatorship or be a part of it. So here he is touring the galleries with, um, with Franco. Uh, and, uh, and interestingly, Leopoldo, and this is one of the reasons that he likely you know, cha changed his political alliances. He was arrested at the outbreak of the of the war, and he was on the verge of of being killed. And it turned out his his mother was a distant cousin of Franco's wife. Um, she went to Salamanca, where the the Francos were, and got a meeting with her cousin and begged her to convince. Her, her husband to, to free Leopoldo, which, which he did, and then Leopoldo joined Franco's army. So I believe this is the only, the, the only time they ever met, and I doubt they talked about, um, about Franco saving his life at, at the last minute, but it's, it's something that, that I've always wondered about. And so the, so the Medicine Museum has several artists who were in this uh, biennial, the, the most prominent being uh, uh, Salvador Dali. So I, I thought I would read another uh, passage from my book, which captures a pretty, <laughs> pretty great um, kind of strange moment that Leopoldo helped engineer and, and also brings in Picasso, who was in Paris during this time and sort of put together a counter biennial to protest what was happening in Spain. So, so Leopoldo and Dali put together an event to sort of attack Picasso. So I'll, I'll read from that. Um, you can follow along here. After nearly a decade living in the United States, Dali was back in Spain, one of the most famous artists in the world, as much for his eccentric personality and pomaded mustache, a shape-shifting work of art itself, as for his surrealist masterpieces, Lorca's old friend claimed to have undergone a spiritual transformation. Dali swore off the surrealism he had pioneered as a young man, as well as modern art altogether, and called for a return to the Renaissance through religious ecstasy. And here are Felicidad and um, Leopoldo with, with the piece he showed there, um, the Christ of St. John of the Cross. This new posture seemed as much performance art as art theory, but Dali claimed that he was a genuine Catholic. 
The Franco regime was all too happy to promote this reinvention of the Catalan painter's aesthetic vision, no matter how flamboyant. And Dali was all too happy to be used as an instrument by the dictatorship. He lent his new painting, uh, Christ of St. John of the Cross to the Biennial and sent a telegram denouncing Picasso, which Leopoldo and others distributed to Spanish newspapers. But, but Dali's crusade against Picasso didn't end there. On November 11th, the uh, Maria Guerrero Theater of Madrid filled with the city's intelligentsia, aristocrats, politicians, and university students. Dali was set to give a, promo a promotional set piece as his biographer Ian Gibson later described it, sure to be as entertaining as it was unpredictable. Felicidad sat with her sons in a box seat while Leopoldo managed the chaos behind the scenes. Dali had always been a divisive figure and the chaos in the crowded theater was so uncontrollable that it caused a 45 minute delay. Then Dali appeared on stage in a pinstriped suit, imperious and defiant, looking like an otter dressed up as a gangster, his mustache waxed upward. Picasso is Spanish, Dali said into microphones of the eager press corps, setting up his famed though nonetheless complimentary jibe at the sincerity of Picasso's politics. Picasso is Spanish, so am I. Picasso is a genius, so am I. Picasso is about 74, I'm about 48. Picasso is known in every country in the world, so am I. Picasso is a communist, nor am I. The event was a feat of perfect propaganda for the government, a work of craftsmanship on par with anything on display in the numerous galleries. Leopoldo's hand was on the pulse of Spanish life and he celebrated the success of Ramil with Dali and other regime officials. He had made a definitive extra poetic choice and now he would be loyal to it. So I, I, I love that story because I think, as we all know, art isn't just art um, and, and there's all these incredible stories about the meaning and meaning behind it. Uh, and, and I love that it, it brings in the museum. And uh, Antoni Tapies is another artist that the museum has who participated in, kind of reluctantly uh, in, that, in that biennial. So this is the, the Leopoldo Panera was from a town called Astorga um, in, in Leon, which is it's a provincial town. And it's kind of this mythical place for the family, like the, the, their, their origin story that they romanticized and came back to kind of a paradise lost. Um, and, then, and then you have Felicidad who came from a, a very wealthy family. And this was her palacete, which means kind of little palace, but kind of a mansion in Madrid. Her father was a, a, a famous surgeon who would be invited to galas at the, at the Royal Palace. So unfortunately it's not there any, anymore. It's just an, just an apartment building. It's, it's beautiful, it was beautiful. And then this is actually in Astorga where Leopoldo was from on the right here. This is a ecumenical, um, or sorry, a Episcopal palace. The, it's a Gaudi um, work that's there and you can still visit. It's, it's really incredible. So now back to the, the family. Here's the three boys as kids. Um, you have Juan Luis, the oldest there in the middle, uh, Leopoldo Maria, uh, um, the, the second child, and then Michi, the, the youngest. And so by the time I started working on my book, they were all, they were all dead. Leo, Leopoldo Maria, the, the middle child, and kind of the one who lived the hardest actually was the last to die. And, um, and I actually had seen El Desencanto uh, uh, before, uh, before he died and started working on an article. And someone gave me the number of the psychiatric institution where he lived and told, said, you know, someone, it was a scholar, the, the, the scholar of his work. And so go and give him a call. But I, I actually, I never, I never did partly because I didn't, I, I know he was sort of a Mecca where people would make these pilgrimages to go see him. And I kind of didn't, want to be one more person wanting to kind of, I don't know, bother him to kind of feel his glory or whatever it was. And also he had these, uh, these kind of um, CIA uh, paranoid persecution fantasies. And I also felt with like, as an American, just calling him up. I don't know. I didn't know if it was just going to be so, so strange. So I never called him in the next year he died. So that, that prophecy in his desencanto did come true of the, the Paneros never not leaving any heirs behind. So here's Juan Luis as, as a young man on his honeymoon in New York on the right. And then as an old man, um, he, he lived in, in Catalonia in, in the later years of his life. 
here's Leopoldo Maria, the middle, the middle son, when he was kind of like the it boy of poetry in the, in the set or early seventies. And then he became this just, uh, kind of literary train wreck. Um, he was a guy that you didn't want at your parties, although there was always good stories about the, all the disaster. And here's him near the end of his life. And he was a kind of a beloved figure in the Canary Islands where he, where he lived in the, by choice and in an asylum and um, would go out and walk around every day and, and everyone kind of knew him. And this is Michi, the youngest son who was, a, uh, a, he was kind of his, he was the, the son who rejected the literary tradition and didn't want to be a writer, even though he kind of couldn't escape it. Um, and so his uh, kind of art and, you know, and social grace or, or, or conversation and social grace were more his art. And he was a, a playboy in Madrid and, and married a movie star, got divorced six months later. And, and the, the documentary really, in a sense, was his, I think, masterpiece because he really pushed for it to happen and gave a lot of ideas to, to the director. And then this is me um, trying to look... Uh, literary there when I visited Astorga um, uh, while working on my book and this is the Leopoldo Panedo's childhood home and then this is the Panedo uh, family crypt in, in Astorga which doesn't have all the family members um, but, but quite a few of them. So that's some of the background on the book, on the documentary and the art that, um, that played a role in the family's story and in which the Meadows Museum uh, has, has connections to. So I thought, so I normally when I give this talk, people haven't seen the documentary. Um, so I usually leave less time for the, the Q and A, but today since people, at least some people I think have seen the documentary and may have some questions, I thought now uh, would be a good time to, to, to open it up. Well, thank you so much. We already have one or two questions in the chat box. So I'm going to invite others to go ahead and drop those questions there. But I actually, I'd like to start with my own question. Um, I am so curious about how the family, how the film was re received and how they kind of lived through that. I mean, I assume they were alive when the film came out and kind of what that was like for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of, that was one of, my favorite parts of the book to write from the making of the film, which was like a total disaster. And the director was like throwing up at night from his nerves and he was fighting with the family and everyone was drunk. And one day one family member leaves the set and doesn't want to come back. So I loved writing that. And then the release of the, the film. So it was kind of, it was one of these, I, I think of it as like before um, we had the word, going by virality it was like it went viral in the way cult films did in the 1970s so it was like this originally was just supposed to be a 20 a weird kind of 20 minute tv documentary and then the director kind of the 20 minutes that he came up with didn't really work it needed to be longer he convinced the producer to do a full feature and and so so they did and i think they just thought it was going to be a weird a kind of weird little movie that kind of the intelligentsia would, would watch. It was about this weird, weird family. They had, they had very low expectations. So it started with just a screening in Madrid with, um, you know, it was kind of like the Panedo and Panedos and all their, their friends um, in, in a theater. And the funny thing is it was sort of like the, the sons and their generation, all the, their friends who of course loved it. And, you know, cause the Panedos say some edgy things on camera. There's even like some sort of literary, uh, playing around with the idea of incest. They talk about dr drugs. You know, there was one, one thing that was the, the one thing that was censored. So supposedly it was one of the, the last act of censorship under, under the regime. It was taking, um, uh, t they took out something that, uh, that Leopoldo Maria said about, get, you know, you know, about homosexuality, um, when he was in prison, they cut that out. So it was just, they were really pushing the boundaries for Spain in, in the 1970s. So they're all, their friends all love that. You know, they're like, and I taught, I interviewed lots of friends who were, um, who were there at, in the theater. And so I was able to reconstruct the scene, but then Leopold or Felicidad, the mother had done the, made the odd choice of inviting all her husband's friends, many of whom she was still friends with to come to the screening. And so 
they were scandalized by the family just attack and basically sort of tarnishing the name, the, the family's name by, you know, pulling out all the dirty laundry and then actually attacking the, the father. And she was actually sitting next to Luis Rosales, the Leopoldo, his best friend who kind of like just stood up in a trance and left, um, and, and left the theater afterwards. And so from there, it was sort of like, at first, little by little, it started, the word started spreading and, and critics started writing about it and saying, this is really interesting. This is just, this is kind of a metaphor. Like here's this family that attacked its father is writing this kind of rewriting its legacy. Isn't that what we're trying to do right now? Franco just died. Is there going to be democracy? Is there going to be some continuation of the, the dictatorship? And then, so it started showing in more theaters and then there was in Granada there was almost a riot in one and the director had to like escape out the back door while people started fighting so it was just it just got it just kept going it kind of went viral and I think in uh, I think in Bar Barcelona and Madrid it, it played for almost a year and so it, it ended up and then the word el desencanto the just disenchantment ended up in, entering the cultural vocabulary um, in, a, in a strange way, at first, it was that people were talking about kind of el desencanto, the disenchantment left by the dictatorship. But then democracy came and there was a lot of compromises in the structure of the, the democracy that, with the amnesties that people were, were really unhappy with. So then it was like democracy was a kind of disenchantment or disillusionment. So the word was applied that way. So it was kind of the word also really took off. And and caught the caught the zeitgeist just like the Paneros did. So it, it was just fascinating. And then and then I think the the film kind of like faded and just became one of those cult things that people whispered to each other about. And then um, and then later in the early '90s, uh, another director made a follow up, a sort of really depressing like "Where Are They Now?" documentary about the 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 family. And it's just the three the three brothers, but they're all in like you know, very rough shape, just basically from hard living. And, um, and so you see who they become. So that's it kind of revived, revived the film. And now the film, I just saw the other day, they were playing it on the, the national uh, television ch channel. It probably plays once or twice a year. People tweet about it and it's, and it's still, it's still there. And people like me still fall in love with the, the family every year. Well, thanks. We're having more and more questions coming in. So I'm going to do our, do my best to get through them. So, try to be quick. Um, <laughs> so the Leopoldo, the father, um, someone is wondering about his turn to, to Franco and is wondering if, if his drinking and his um, let's see if, if the drinking and his incarceration perhaps played into that. Yeah, it's, that's one of those things it's hard to read. He was really cryptic about that, even like when he would clearly written fascist poetry, then later in his life, he wrote this poem about how, why, how do people call me fascist? Like he was kind of strange and hard to pin down about the whole, the whole thing. I mean, I think he definitely went that way. I think there was some survival instinct that pushed him that way. And then actually having camaraderie with, um, with, you know, fellow soldiers and fellow writers on that end of, uh, the political divide, he did find some, some kinship with it. And he was, he was sort of a, tr in a traditional Spanish person in a way and, and liked some of those traditions that the dictatorship was so committed to. I think the drink, I think the kind of, my reading of the drinking was his, well, I think it was a legacy of the war. It was like his brother dying. He'd already um, lost a sister to tuberculosis. And then so many, it was like his whole life just got, I mean, it's not this, it's different from COVID, but in the same, in the same way that life just like stops and everything changes and relationships change where you can go change, people die. And I think that left its mark. And I think one way to read his, his drinking is that it would just took a, such a toll on him. That's, it was his way of, of dealing with it. Um, and then I think maybe there's also people who say, oh, it was also, you know, he was, he regretted the compromises he had to make politically and was ashamed and maybe drank, drank for that. Thank you. So can you remind us the, the biennial that he was involved in organizing? What year was that? Terry um, is very surprised that Tapias participated. Oh <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I think, I think it was, I'll have to check. I think it was 1952, but let me pull up a Tapias 
quote that I have here from that. Um, um, let's see. Uh, I'm not, I'll have to check the year. I think it's 52. But okay. it says, uh, from the book, I say, on top of all this, Leopoldo had to ensure that the works he selected did the impossible, satisfied the Franco, Franco's aesthetic sensibility for the good of the patria, as the artist Antonio Tapia sarcastically put it, while still being uh, relevant to, to contemporary art. Um, although I, sh I, I should double, that's a good question. I should double check if Tapia's actually opted out of the last minute. Or, or did um, participate. I'll, I know, but there were there were several letters between him and Leopoldo. So this is a question from Chrissy and Jeremy, who's wondering if there's any contemporary family that you might compare uh, compare this family to. Either someone who is like a gifted literary family, or let's see, um, a family that is divided politically. Mm -hmm. um, but well, hello, Jamie and Chrissy, my really good friends who are coming to us from Mexico. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I don't know about literary. I think I always think of the Kardashians as, well, I think of the Paneros as the pre-Kardashians in the sense of they understood the power of um, exhibitionist self-exposure and performing in front of a camera and the, what they, you know, what that can do for you, um, kind of in terms of fame. Um, so I, I like to think of the, yeah, I like to think of the Kardashians, I, you know, I, well, I'm gonna dodge the whole question since I don't you know if I have the perfect thing, but I think when I think of, I also think of what families are like metaphors for a time and place, the way that the Kennedys and Camelot kind of get read that way. And I actually, I think in a way like the Trump family is kind of, uh, is a great metaphor for a lot of things that have happened in, in, in society. So I think there are families that can, you can read them um, as metaphors. In terms of uh, in our, an artistic family, I don't know if there's any one that, that quite tracks. I would, I would have to think more about that. I, I know there's different siblings, fathers and sons that you have in the, the, the arts and, um, and film, but I don't know if there's anyone that's this kind of just big uh, dysfunctional metaphorical unit that's, I, that, that's quite like that. I, I like to, I, I think it's more something you see in, in other fictions like the Royal Tenenbaums or the, or the Glass fam, family from Salinger. I like that when people ask what my book is about, I like to say that it's like succession meets the Royal Tenenbaums, but, but in Spain. Um, so I think, I think, I mean, clearly, uh, flamboyant uh, um, dysfunctional families never get get old. We never lose interest in them. <laughs> so we have a couple um, comments and questions uh, that are interested in Felicidad. So Kathy notes that there seems that throughout the film, she seems to be silenced by her sons who constantly talk over her. But she also notes that there seems to be kind of a rebirth of interest in her and her work right now. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of what it is about our moment right now that that she might be reclaimed in a way? Um, that's that's interesting. Well, and the, the cool thing about Felicidad, yeah, I mean, she just got, I mean, she gets trampled in the film, and then she gets just attacked. So, you know, they really gang up on her in that scene in the the patio, the patio, although she, you know she deals with it in a very dignified way. Um, so, you know, the cool thing was after the film came out, she got, she published her memoir, which was sort of like her turn to, to say, um, you know, uninterrupted what she felt and, and tell her, her story. And there, were, and, and there was a lot of interest in her. She acted in a couple films, like directors just kind of liked her and wanted her in a, in a, in a couple films. In terms of the interest um, right now, so yeah, I, I um, yeah, I have a friend who wrote who wrote a, a wonderful introduction to a, a collection of Felicidad's um, stories that, that that came out recently, and her memoir was reissued about I think around 10, 10 years ago. Uh, so why that why that's happening now? I mean, the the easy answer is there's just you know the culture is coming around to you know giving women's voices more primacy, and there's. Um, real interest in, in rediscovering people who are, who are eclipsed. Uh, and I think beyond, which is kind of the generic, but I think, I think that 
answer that does you know speak speak to that is I think she's just a sort of timelessly intriguing figure. Like she she doesn't get she doesn't get old. She is like this kind of she's seductive in the the, the physical sense of be you know be it she many fell in love with her, but also in the like the sense of her intelligence of being a storyteller. Um, and so I think there's just something about her personally that's very idiosyncratic and she represents this kind of romantic European idea of the, of the, the, the decadence of the aristocrat, aristocratic class, um, which her, her family and her art really was. And I think, you know, people are still um, dr drawn to, to that idea. So that, that's my, that's my, um, <laughs> the best I can do. Um, we have a few more questions, but I'm wondering if while we address those, would you be able to to share your screen again and go back to some of the um, the, lo the locations of of where they lived? We have someone who wants to to see those again, so perhaps that could be the backdrop for our continued conversation. Sure, definitely. Thank you. Um, so while you do that, um, I will continue on. So I just have to note that Jim, who is joining us, um, has written that he actually lived with Felicidad um, oh. in the early 70s. He was there studying abroad, and he mentioned that she was very pessimistic about what would happen after Franco's death. And someone else was wondering um, about... Oh, can um, I just interject for yes, a second? Yes, please so do. I, I, this is great. I have to connect, Jim, I'll have to connect you with like the um, the group of study abroad students who lived with Felicidad who have contacted me um, at, at different points. And one of, one of them was before I published the book. So I did a great interview with him um, that I included of his Im impressions. And I think it was two, two or three others connected me after. So e email me if, you don't, if you'd like to, to get in touch with them um, through my website. But it, yeah, I love the, the stories of the people who actually lived with her. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> um, so someone else was wondering, and I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through all the questions and I'm having a hard time finding it. But um, if anyone, if any of them lived to see Spain transition to democracy and kind of how they felt about, well, I suppose they did. So how they felt about that. Yeah, everyone except Leopoldo, the the father, which hit, of course, his reaction, I would be, would have been most interested in because after the democratic transition was when a lot of these people, oh, there's, there's Peter, Peter was one of the other students who, uh, who studied abroad with Felicidad, who I interviewed for the book is, off, is, is here. Wow, this is great. This is, a, this is great. Um, so, so the interesting is af after the, the dictatorship and the transition to doc democracy, figures who were very much like Leopoldo, who had had this kind of fascist regime past, kind of reinvented themselves or published memoirs or saying, this is why I did what I, what I did, or this was my, these were my real politics. And so um, they, they, they called it el, el lavado de cara, like the washing of the face that people did publicly, that they tried to kind of get a leg up in democracy. So I would, I, very curious. I wish I could know what Leopoldo would have done during democracy if he would have published a memoir or told his version of why he did what he what he did. Um, in the end, the, the sons. I mean, the, the sons. Obviously, they democracy for them was was freedom. I mean, I, things were already loosening up a lot in the late '60s and early '70s in terms of cultural permissiveness, drinking, sex. But you know, but then it was really the '80s were just wild in Spain. Um, the stape la movida of of this really cultural explosion of, of experimentation, sex, drugs, rock and roll. So the sons were were uh, especially Nietzsche and Leopoldo Maria were involved in that culture, counterculture blossoming. And then and Juan Luis was a little bit um, older, so he was a bit further from that. But um, in in Felicidad, you know, she lived from um, you know from. The, you know, the, I think she was born in 1913, um, you know, from, she really saw Spain change so much. And I think obviously she was happy to be in, in democracy rather than under the dictatorship. 
but I think also it was just seeing, you know, a long, hard century for, for that Spain had, had gone through. I think she was just left with a, an inescapable mel melancholy. That was sort of her, her comfort, her comfort zone um, was melancholy. So, I mean, the interesting thing about Leopoldo Maria, who, who is a poet of sort of, I think in some ways art flourishes when it has something to write against or speak against. And so, and in, in I think some people argue, and I can see this, that in a way Leopoldo's um, genius didn't have as much of a, or it didn't quite know where to go when it didn't have the big wall of the dictatorship to throw itself up against. So, I mean, he still published fantastic poetry after the, after democracy came, but I think um, it was kind of a different sort of poetry when he was, you know, getting thrown in prison and, um, and spending months in, in jail. And, you know, there really was true censorship. Thank you. So there's one more question, but before that, I just want to note that in the chat box, I put a link to Aaron's website to the contact him form. I know there's someone who would really love to get their hands on some of these images, and I will leave it to you to email Aaron. And then, of course, um, it sounds like we have some new connections that have been made with Felicity Dodd. Um, so contact information is in the chat. So the final question as of now, at least, is if you have a sense of Felicidad's kind of feelings or opinions on uh, Dali. On, on Dali, um, I think, well, I think Felicidad was a per so she was just in love with art, literature, and all she ever wanted was just to be around artists or, or writers. And and she married, a, she married a writer, and as she said, um, you know, appearing in a poem is not the same as spending your life beside that, that poet. And it's, it's not great. In her experience, it wasn't great, um, even though part of the reason she fell in love with, with, uh, with Leopoldo was because he wrote poems about her. So she was, she was always drawn to artists because they sort of elevated life into something more meaningful. Um, so in terms of Dali, I know that she was thrilled to, to meet him. And I, and I think she represented, you know, or he represented for her, like the, the, the role of the artist of, of, you know, turning the banality of life into something stranger and, and, more, and more lasting and more meaningful. So I, I know that, you know, spending time with him and seeing the art was very um, special for her, but she doesn't say that much more than that. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know um, we still have people looking to contact you. So for Robin, I will share your email address with Aaron and ask that he reach out to you. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for, for sharing this incredible family and this movie and this wonderful uh, book that you have written about them and bringing this whole kind of, to me at least, unknown uh, chapter of Spanish history to light. So thank you so much for joining us all the way from Spain. We appreciate so much and thank all of you for joining um, us here at the Meadows Museum this afternoon. Yes, thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for, for coming and, and spending some time with the Panetas. Take care, bye-bye.